Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Donnie Passo. I am a rabbi at Harvard Hillel and a Harvard chaplain. Welcome to the second installment in our ongoing series on coronavirus. Last week, we heard from Professor Michael Sandel and Rabbi Shai Held. Uh, this coming Sunday, we will also have a chance to hear from Steven Pinker. That will be at 7.30 p.m. and more lectures to follow. Uh, this evening, we are honored to have Professor Noah Feldman with us. Uh, Professor Feldman is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law and the Director of the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law at Harvard Law School. Uh, Noah Feldman specializes in constitutional studies with a particular emphasis on the relationship between law and religion, free speech, constitutional design, and the history of legal theory. He is also Senior Fellow of the Society of Fellows at Harvard. Uh, Professor Feldman is enormously prolific. He's the author of eight books, the most recent of which is Three Lives of James Madison, Genius, Partisan, President. He's also the host of the podcast Deep Background, which recently has had a number of outstanding episodes on coronavirus, and I highly recommend you check those out. Uh, Professor Feldman also testified as an expert witness in the recent presidential impeachment inquiry. Uh, for many on this call, they may actually know Noah uh, from the time that he was born. His bris and bar mitzvah took place at as part of the Orthodox minion of Harvard Hillel, I currently serve as the rabbi. And so I also want to offer a special welcome to Professor Feldman on behalf of our minion. Uh, Noah, I also wanna say uh, perhaps a bit uh, of a confession here that I first encountered your work about 20 years ago when I was in high school. Uh, and I think at that point you were writing about every other week for the New York Times Magazine. And that would always arrive a day early. So I would get it on Saturday mornings and before going to shul to services uh, on Saturday, I'd usually take a peek at some of the articles. And if it was an article by you, I often got too enthralled and ended up reading the entire article and then arriving uh, to services late, at which point my grandfather would welcome me uh, saying, uh, you're early for Mincha. Uh, so I certainly don't hold you accountable uh, for that, but I just want to share that uh, little anecdote with you. Uh, if anyone does have any questions for Professor Feldman, uh, I'm gonna put into the link uh, a Google form so you can fill that out. And without further ado, Professor Noah Feldman. Thank you, Rabbi Paso, very much. Um, it's not the first time that I've been directly or indirectly involved in making somebody late for shul, and it probably won't be the last, so I'll, uh, I'll just take that for what it's worth. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to see, at least in a miniature, uh, so many familiar faces. I see students, I see teachers of mine, I see friends, um, I see uh, my chavruta, my study partner, uh, Isaac Correa, who always makes me a little nervous when I'm going to speak about a Talmudic topic, uh, because Isaac is sure to sure to uh, sure to set me straight. Um, anyway, I'm thrilled to see uh, so many of you, and also thrilled to see uh, new faces as well. So uh, thank you all. the The topic I wanted to to speak about relatively briefly before opening it up for as much virtual conversation as we can pull off um, is broadly speaking the topic of Passover and pandemic. And I think it's probably natural for just about all of us to have thought in recent weeks about the juxtaposition between those two things, simply for calendrical reasons. I mean, no matter where you are in the world, and I think we probably have people listening in from lots of places, you have to be thinking seriously now about uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And if your life is in any way, however peripherally, um, shaped in relationship to a religious calendar, whether it's a Jewish religious calendar, which gives you Passover coming, uh, or a Christian religious calendar that gives you Easter coming, or a Muslim religious calendar that moves around the uh, seasons um, a little, in a little bit more of a um, free-flowing way, but that nevertheless acclimates uh, the, the, the viewer to wondering whose holidays are going on at any given moment, you have to be thinking about the uh, juxtaposition of these two things. And I've read some interesting explorations of that, uh, of that juxtaposition in, uh, in various sources in recent days. But the one that uh, got me the most motivated to, uh, to talk about this topic was um, a piece by a very brilliant scholar at the Harvard Society of Fellows called Tamara Morsell Eisenberg, still not published, um, where she explores the opinions of early modern rabbis on the question of what you should do in an epidemic, a topic that was of great importance um, in the early modern period, and of course, as well in the, in the medieval period. 
And she cited a passage in the Babylonian Talmud, um, Bava Kama 60b, if you're following at home, uh, or um, if you already know the passage and, uh, and want to uh, engage with it. And that's a passage which, to my astonishment, directly juxtaposes already in its own terms the question of pandemic with the question of Passover. And when I say Passover, I mean very literally the passing over passage. The passage in the book of Exodus in which uh, the text uh, reports God's direction to the children of Israel that at the moment uh, of the eve of the Passover, after they've slaughtered their Paschal lamb, and they must take the blood and famously paint the blood on the two doorposts and on the lintel of their homes in order to uh, assure that the, um, the destructive presence that's coming to destroy the, to kill the firstborn will not enter their homes. And then the verse ends in Hebrew, ve'atam lo tetzu ishmi petach beto ad boker. Uh, which translates into English as, and you do not leave your homes, each man must not leave his home until the morning. So that's the biblical verse uh, that, with, that the rabbis uh, of the Talmud are interested in engaging. And they've got three different juxtaposed passages in which they consider potential meaning that could be derived from that. And um, the third of these actually relates directly to pandemic. But before I get to that one, let me report to you the first two passages. So the first, and again, this is the, the Babylonian Talmud, um, which is uh, edited and compiled uh, circa the sixth or seventh century, um, tells you, um, I'll just, I'll just uh, read it to you. Um, let's see, where's the exact spot? Here we go. Tani Rabbi Yosef. Um, Rabbi Yosef asks, Rabbi Yosef asks, Why does the verse say, and this is the verse that I just quoted to you, um, do not leave your homes, uh, one man amongst you, until the morning? And he answers, once permission had been given to the destroyer, and you want to write that destroyer with a capital D, the, uh, the angel of death, if you will, he, namely that destroyer, does not distinguish between the righteous and the evil. Now, you have to deduce, as sometimes is the case in the Talmud, you have to deduce the question that the Talmud was asking from the answer that the Talmud gives. And this is one of those instances where you have to do that. So what's the question that the Talmud must be asking that is answered, um, why shouldn't you leave your house? Well, because God doesn't, did not uh, tell the destroyer to distinguish between the righteous and the evildoers. And the answer is that the question must be, why was it necessary for, the, for God to instruct the ancient Israelites not to leave their homes after they had marked their homes as safe? In other words, the Talmud is wondering if, it imagine, if we imagine an omnipotent God and an omniscient God who has total power and total knowledge, once the Israelites have performed the required right, why should it be necessary for them to stay inside? Right? After all, God should have the capacity to distinguish whether they are the good who should be spared or the evil uh, who should not be spared. And what I think is interesting about the answer, the Talmud's answer, which is that once the destroyer has been set free to destroy, has been given permission to destroy, the destroyer no longer distinguishes between the good and the evil, is twofold. First, it suggests that in a plague, and I think the last of the 10 plagues, the death of the firstborn, is certainly a plague by any ordinary sense of the term. In a plague, you can't actually distinguish, no one can distinguish the righteous from the unrighteous when it comes to who is killed. Now, that may seem rather obvious um, to anyone raised on the germ theory of the disease. There's no moral valence whatsoever arising with respect to who is uh, injured or who dies. And we all, I hope, accept that more or less intuitively today. But you have to remember that in the rabbinic worldview, the Talmudic rabbinic worldview, there is meant to be a God, and that God is meant to be capable of exercising divine providence to keep an eye on people and to punish 
the guilty and to forgive or pardon or spare the good. So what's striking to me about this passage is that it strongly suggests, in fact, it states that when a plague is in business, the instinct that the believer might have, the traditional believer might have, to apply moral judgment to the events in question is actually a mistake, is actually an analytic mistake. Why? Because in the words of the Talmud, once the destructive agent is free to destroy, there is no longer a distinction between good and evil. So I want to emphasize that's a somewhat, that's not a shocking statement from our perspective, but it is a shocking statement, or mildly shocking statement at least, maybe more than mildly shocking, from a traditional rabbinic perspective, because it's suggesting that there are natural phenomena that are outside of the bounds of the traditional rabbinic picture, and indeed the biblical picture for that matter, of intentional choice of who should be punished and who should be spared. Notice that that's being juxtaposed exactly with the Passover story, which itself is trying in the biblical context to suggest precisely the idea of distinction, right? By, by, um, by spreading the blood on their uh, doorposts, the ancient Israelites are distinguishing themselves from the Egyptians, and they're going to be spared and passed over by, uh, by the, the angel of death. So I think that that's the first passage, and I think it already is a very rich one. And there is, I think, a potential takeaway for our contemporary world as well, uh, suggesting that our usual practice, I shouldn't say our, but the practice that some people engage in of at attaching moral meaning to destructive events like epidemics may in fact be inappropriate uh, when analyzed in terms of a, a broadly destructive event. And I think you know, that could be true with respect to traditional religious believers who are eager to say, thus and such is being punished and thus and such is being rewarded. That's the scenario that the Talmud envisions. But it might also be true if we were to try to draw um, moral judgments with respect to different countries that are stricken, uh, different sources of that striking. There is a powerful impulse, which I think is still with us, to moralize a narrative of epidemic, or in our case of pandemic. The impulse to moralize is more or less everywhere. I don't think any country that I've read about thus far is free of this, uh, of this impulse. And you can see it very clearly. The Chinese would like to moralize that the United States is responsible. Some of the United States would like to moralize that the Chinese are responsible. These are not unique to those countries. These are simply instances of a much broader human phenomenon of seeking to moralize. And this passage in the Talmud, in my view, at least opens us to the possibility that that's a category error that we ought not to be moralizing under these conditions. Okay, um, so that's the first passage. Uh, let me move on to uh, the next passage. The next passage is even more directly pandemic uh, adjacent, um, and it reads as follows. Um, sorry, that I'm, I'm, I'm I was skipping. That the second is uh, perhaps a little less pandemic adjacent, but it, it goes as follows. It says, um, Rav Yehuda says, um, According to Rav, Leolami Kanesa Dam Bechitov Vietse Bechitov. So uh, Rav Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda, quoting another rabbi who's known as Rav, says, a person should always leave the house at it is good, Kitov, and he also ought to return the Kitov in it is good. Now, to understand the meaning of this passage, you need to do a little bit of um, biblical textual gamesmanship. So the words kitov, it is good, are borrowed here from the creation narrative in Genesis. And in the creation narrative of Genesis, one of the days, uh, the third day of creation, gets the word it was good twice. In the other day's narratives, the, um, the Genesis text tells us uh, God, God saw that it was good, and it only says that once per day. But on Tuesday, it gets two. And in fact, I remember one of my uh, teachers uh, at the Maimonides School would, uh, to cheer us up on a Tuesday, would say, you know, happy Tuesday. He always said this in Hebrew. And he would say, you know, Tuesday, pa'amayim kitov. Twice the words kitov appear. So Tuesday must be a particularly good day. Make that, and I, it made an impression on me because I, I've never heard anybody thinking of Tuesday as a particularly good day before. I think of Tuesday as a particularly grim sort of day. Um, but in any case, um, uh, so the words kitov mean it was good, 
they refer to Tuesday, and that gets you almost all the way there. But the last bit is you also have to take on board that on Tuesday also is Tuesday is also the day that day, day three is the day in Genesis where um, the light sources, the heavenly light sources, the sun and the moon are described as being created, notably uh, a day after the creation of light and darkness. So we will we won't go into that uh, that cosmic question of how you can have light and dark without the sun and the moon. We're going to pass right over that. But the to translate all this into this passage in the Talmud, one can deduce that what's going on is that the Talmudic adage is saying, when you're leaving the, the home, when you're going out to do something, you should go out in daylight. And when you return, you should also return in daylight. And at least that's how the medieval commentators like Rashi interpret uh, this formulation. And then um, the proof text is our proof text from Exodus, uh, as it is written, you do not go out from your house until morning. So here, the proof text is being taken in a very literal sense to mean, in general, don't leave your house until the morning, not only when uh, the angel of death is about, but all of the time. Only leave the house when it's light out and try to return while it's still light out. Now, at a literal level, this seems to respect reflect a strong preference for traveling in the daytime. And you could imagine that might have health and safety uh, implications in a society that didn't have illumination. Uh, there might be thieves out at night, there might be bandits out at night, um, there's certainly no street lights, yeah, you're potentially vulnerable uh, physically. Um, but it's also likely the case that this reflects a rabbinic conception, uh, and this is what Rashi thinks as well, the medieval commentator, the medieval conception that there are all sorts of dangers afoot in the night, including um, non-physical dangers. There might be ghosts, there might be uh, demons, um, there might be unspecified forms of um, pollution uh, in the air, uh, an idea that's been popular throughout all uh, periods of history. Now, I thought about whether there's a nice modern way to um, metaphorize the idea of go out in the daytime and come back uh, in the daytime. And there probably is. I mean, I could think of a few, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna apply them. And the reason is that I think it's, it's part of my own approach to saying the Talmud, that one can often come up with interesting contemporary applications of the Talmudic passages, but it's also sometimes good just to remember that the Talmud is a work of an entirely different period, emphasizing an entirely different worldview. And that difference, I think, deserves to be recognized. And that in the rabbinic worldview, there is magic everywhere. The rabbis are not only scholars, they're not only wise men, the rabbis, at least some of them, are wizards. And I'm using the word wizard in its, you know, in a sort of technical sense. They are men who are capable of generating tremendous power, of accessing sources of power that are not precisely divine, but they may be, you know, within the general uh, bailiwick of God's powers. They're not, they're not prophets, um, but they are people who are in touch with the realm of the supernatural. And I think um, this passage suggests exactly that uh, notion of the Talmudic worldview. And what's interesting about it is that it generalizes the advice of the biblical verse. The biblical verse is saying, go out any night you want, but don't go out on Passover night when the angel of death is about. And the rabbis generalize that to a notion of general concern. Don't go out ever at night, they're saying. You know, stay home all the time because the world is a dangerous place and the world is a dangerous place all the time. In that sense, it's as though the text were suggesting, the Talmudic text were suggesting that it's Passover every night, which um, is fascinating and, to my mind, rather troubling and disturbing. Okay, so now let me come to the third passage, which is the passage that um, I mentioned earlier is the one that most directly connects epidemic to Passover. Uh, to know Rabbi Nan, uh, the rabbis taught, uh, this one, uh, this statement is not merely a generally attributed rabbinic statement, but a statement in a brighta, that is to say, a statement uh, from a compilation of rabbinic sayings um, from the period of the Mishnah, but not included in the Mishnah itself. Dever ba'ir kanes raglecha. If there is an epidemic in the city, gather in thy feet. And there's some debate among the commentators about what gather in thy feet means, but it's actually quite clear uh, in context that what it means is don't go out at all because a little bit later on the page, we'll hear the second part of the same statement, ra'av ba'ir, pazer If there is famine in the city, 
spread thy feet. And spread thy feet clearly means get out, you know, flee the city. Kanes raglacha, gather thy feet, pretty clearly in context means stay put. Do not leave the city at a moment when there is a, uh, an epidemic. And then the proof text is, what do you know? Our same Exodus proof text, as it is written, you do not go out of your homes uh, until the morning. And then several other verses are, uh, are juxtaposed to support this uh, idea and to suggest that this is not only a question of uh, the nighttime, but is under circumstances of a genuine um, epidemic, one ought not to leave the city. Now, why would the rabbis think that the takeaway of the don't leave your house is uh, that under conditions of an epidemic, you shouldn't leave the city? Well, at the most literal level, the explanation is that their, their proof text verse says, don't leave your house. So if you're not meant to leave your house, maybe you're not supposed to leave the city. But that's obviously not sufficient because the rabbis don't have to have used this proof text. And they could, if they had wished, clearly have interpreted it in a different way. So what's, what's going on? Well, it seems pretty likely uh, from the context of this verse, and we know it's definitely true for later periods. Sorry, not from the context of the verse, from the context of the Talmudic statement, that there was already a genuine debate in the period of the Talmud about what it was rational to do or advisable to do, if you don't like the word rational, under epidemic conditions. And that there was genuine uncertainty about whether you were better off getting out of the city or whether you were better off staying put. And what's interesting is that the rabbinic decision here, um, and there's an open question as to whether it's meant to be legally binding or meant to be merely advisory, Later rabbis really sweat over this. Um, in the context, it's a little unclear whether it's meant to be merely advisory or whether it's meant to be a rule. Um, but the conclusion in this passage is that you shouldn't leave. You shouldn't leave. Now, it's interesting. Um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Tamara Morsal Eisenberg, who, uh, whose work on the rabbinic response of the 17th century got me interested in this passage in the first place. She shows in her, in her essay, which I, as I say, I hope will come out in the next few days, that essentially, Every early modern rabbi thought it was a very good idea to get out of a city when there was a epidemic. Um, and that meant that this Talmudic passage was a problem for those rabbis. And they had to come up with interpretations that would justify avoiding the Talmudic dictum to stay put in the midst of an epidemic. And they came up with all sorts of different theories. One of the theories that she quotes is the idea that one should, um, uh, if you know early that there's an epidemic, you should get out of town. But if you don't know it on the early side, if you only find out later, then you should stay put. And I think what's, what's fascinating to me about this passage is that, first of all, the debate about the best way to respond to an epidemic is as old as epidemics. We think that our reaction to the events of the present um, is original, unique, uh, that these events are unprecedented. Whatever the opposite of unprecedented is, that's what these events are. They are profoundly precedented. Um, you know, in fact, these events were much more common. Epidemic events were extremely frequent in the entirety of the pre-modern world and into the ancient world. What feels unprecedented about it to us is that we've lost our consciousness of the probability and the regularity of such epidemics. So our statement that something is um, unprecedented is really a statement of the shortness of our memories. So that's a sort of first point. Um, the second point is that the rabbinic mind grappled with and struggled with exactly this uh, question. And we have to figure out exactly why the rabbi thought it was the case that when there was a, an epidemic, you should stay put, but that if there was a famine, you ought to leave. Now, I'm not sure that we can attribute, in fact, I'm pretty sure that we shouldn't attribute to the rabbis a kind of inchoate sense that by spreading people around, you would spread the disease, right? It's very tempting to do that. It's very tempting to say that the rabbis are embodying here some proto version of the germ theory of disease. Um, I, I had a, a close friend in, in high school who I used to study Talmud with in high school, and he, he would refer to the rabbi, he, he went on to, be, to become an engineer, um, and he used to refer to the rabbi's R&D department. And he, he, would, he would say, you could imagine the rabbis, you know, walking around doing these little experiments, you know? The rabbis are always debating these kinds of questions. How long does it take to eat a slice of bread? The rabbis have an answer to that. 
you know, like they have an exact numerical answer to that. So he, his, he was, his, you imagine their R&D department, they were trying these things out. I don't think it's probably right to say that the rabbis here were anticipating the idea that one ought not to leave. Rather, I think what the rabbis are anticipating is a kind of solidarity. It's a kind of solidarity associated with circumstances of pandemic and interestingly, not associated with the circumstances of famine when the rabbis are happy to advocate flight. And what's interesting is that that sense of solidarity seems to derive from their picture of the Passover. It's their choice of this particular proof verse that says, don't leave your house when this form of, uh, of epidemic is occurring that drives them towards this notion of sheltering in place. And if we try to figure out why that is the case, surely the answer has to do with precisely their idea that Passover stands for, and this verse stands for the idea of seeking divine protection and salvation through the connection to the family home. The idea here is under circumstances of unpredictable and instant harm, remain in place. Now, taken as a lesson for Jewish history, this would not be a good lesson. I mean, I, I, I think it'd be oversimplification to say that the central lesson of Jewish history is that when things get bad, you should flee. I think it would be a gross oversimplification to call that the central lesson of Jewish history. But you know, if you were gonna make a list of the 10 most important lessons of Jewish history, I actually think flee you know, would be a good, you, know, you could just do that one word, flee, would be actually be on my list of top 10 takeaway lessons of the Jewish historical experience. So it's sort of interesting that under condition in this, in this passage, um, the, the rabbis think that one should remain. And perhaps, and here, if you'll forgive me a uh, metaphor, um, perhaps we could say that the reason not to flee under these circumstances is the idea that on the eve of the Passover, the solidarity of the home becomes the solidarity of the Jewish people and of Jewish experience. You're remaining home on the night of Passover rather than fleeing on the night of Passover, because that is the archetypal moment of connection and of identity formation. Now, lest we forget, on the morning of the first day of Passover in the Exodus narrative, the Israelites fled. I mean, the Exodus is a flight narrative. So it's not like they're not going to flee, but they're going to flee the next morning. They're not gonna flee that night. And so the decision to remain under these conditions of pandemic, I think may be taken metaphorically to refer to the necessity of forming a strong sense of selfhood, of identity, of connection, and of symbolic ritual meaning before fleeing to the four corners of the earth. And the benefit of that, if I may say so, uh, without being too didactic, might just be that if you flee without first congregating ritualizing and telling your narrative, then you will indeed be dispersed to the four corners of the earth and there will be no memory of you uh, any longer. If on the other hand, you build a narrative, focus on that narrative, repeat that narrative, and then you flee, you can preserve uh, to the extent you're able to your physical well-being, while simultaneously being able to preserve the uh, theological, spiritual, cultural content of what makes you, you. And for many of us, Passover is the archetypal moment when we try to figure out what our central message is. And it's all the more important when we're isolated, away from extended family, perhaps away from anyone at all, perhaps alone in our houses uh, or apartments, perhaps with one or two other people. The impulse to be with others on Passover is tremendously strong. But for those of us who won't be with others, that's fine. We have the built up capacities and meanings of our narrative of all of our other Passovers. And we have that from this Passover. And then that will enable us to flee when necessary to the four corners of the earth, but to flee the next morning when the light is out under the sign of it is good and with the genuine capacity to survive uh, and, if at all possible in the future, to return.
So with apologies for the ever so slightly homiletic conclusion, um, I hope that was of, uh, of at least some interest to, to those of you out there. It's hard to avoid uh, pure homily on the eve of a holiday. Um, and uh, when the Hillel asks me to speak, I generally try not to give a pure academic lecture. I have, I have a day job giving pure academic lectures, so it's nice to have the opportunity to do something uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more homiletic. So I wanna uh, thank, uh, thank the Hillel and, and thank Danny for uh, setting this up. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions, which Danny will explain how you should convey. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you so much, Professor Feldman. If you do have a question, uh, in the link, uh, in the email that included the link for this uh, Zoom call, there was also a Google form. So you can click on that and go write your question in there. Also on Harvard Hillel's Facebook page, if you go to Facebook and type in Harvard Hillel, you can also find a link to that form. So I'll be monitoring that. Uh, but in the meantime, Professor Feldman, uh, so first of all, thank you. Um, I mean, many of us are missing those homilies or those dress shows. Uh, so rabbis are missing giving them, and hopefully congregants are also missing hearing them. So <laughs> I think that's very welcome. Uh, a question that I have for you is, um, you know, many within the ultra-Orthodox community uh, continue to congregate in their synagogues uh, after a point in which uh, most public health officials and even governments were telling people not to do so. Uh, and I can see that one might make an argument from what you just shared, that there might be a certain level of significance or spiritual importance to congregating, not in the home in this case, but in the synagogue. Um, how might you uh, respond to the argument that perhaps uh, one might read into what you shared, which is that there might be a sufficiently spiritual reason to congregate uh, in a synagogue, perhaps ongoing or perhaps for some amount of time, even if that poses some kind of uh, public health risk? You know, I'm, um, I'm looking a little bit further down on that same page of the Talmud to see if I can find the passage that I read just earlier today as I was um, reading through it. And so uh, here I'm going to read you a passage. Don't rely on me, rely on the rabbis. So this is the same page, Baba Kama 60b. Tana Rabbanan, the rabbis taught in a Brinabrita. Dever ba'ir ali kanesa dam yachid beta knesset shamalach hamavet mavkid sham kila. It says, when there is an epidemic in the city, a man should not enter the synagogue even alone or alone because the angel of death uh, prepares, his, uh, prepares his weapons there. Okay, so don't trust me. Trust the Talmud. And I would say if you shouldn't show up, in the, if in the middle of an epidemic you should not go to the synagogue even alone, uh, it would certainly follow that you ought not to go to the synagogue uh, as a group. So I, I say that, you know, not flippantly, but, you know, maybe slightly lightheartedly, but of course, it's not a lighthearted issue. Um, the, the very powerful impulse to community, which is central, I think, for all who identify as Jews, and perhaps central for people who identify with almost all uh, world religions to feel connected to a community, um, is one that's felt especially strongly in the Haredi community, um, where communal life is so central. Um, and the impulse to congregate, uh, therefore, is, I think, an understandable one. Um, but it's one that is, I think, fair to say, deeply misguided uh, in, a moment of, uh, in a moment of communal crisis. Um, I also think that there's a complex issue there that has to do with the traditional uh, Jewish distrust of civil authorities. You know, one of the features of the, there are many ways in which the Haredi or ultra-Orthodox communities communities are very modern, notwithstanding their self-presentation is in certain ways rejecting the modern. There are many ways in which those communities are, in fact, archetypally modern. But one way in which they're not so modern is that they preserve some attitudes that were traditional Jewish attitudes um, in Eastern Europe. And one of those is a sense of distrust of civil authorities. And that distrust is carried over uh, to a certain degree in the United States, even where the civil authorities are democratic and liberal and where um, you know, ultra-Orthodox Jews have the, the right to participate uh, and the same fundamental rights as any other citizens. And it's also carried over even in Israel where the state is not only, I mean, I was about to say the state is liberal democratic, but where the state is, let's say, aspirationally liberal democratic, I'm not so sure that it, that it is exactly at this moment, um, but where at least it's aspirationally so and where the ultra-Orthodox have an even larger say uh, in the running of the affairs of the state. I mean, it's an irony that ultra-Orthodox um, Haredi uh, unwillingness to follow health directives in Israel took place at a time when the Minister of Health of the State of Israel was himself 
a Haredi Jew who gives press conferences in Strymel and Bekesha. Um, I mean, it's sort of, it's astonishing on many levels. First of all, the idea, it's astonishing that in a modern democracy, as it were, aspirational democracy, the, um, you know, the Minister of Health, in fact, gives his press conferences in Estrymal and Bekesha. That's astonishing in its own way. Um, but then it's astonishing that even under those circumstances, uh, distrust of the state remain. And I think that's a real factor that has to be taken into account here. And perhaps, perhaps, uh, the events here may have some positive effect in terms of shifting uh, that, shifting that attitude. Um, I'd also note that the sense of isolation that the Haredi community feels is real. I mean, it's, it's a, a strange, strange, strange accident of history that at least if people who have Netflix, many, many people on Netflix are watching uh, the show Unorthodox, which I've only watched one episode of it. I watched an episode last night and it seemed fascinating and, and interesting. But from the standpoint of um, the Haredi background, a show that's basically about a woman's challenging, difficult choice to leave that community uh, stands precisely for a sense of their alienation from, from mainstream American life, uh, or the same would be true in Israel. So that sense of um, marginalization doesn't usually tend to trust the sense of trust of mainstream institutions. I'll add that that health minister, I believe, also uh, has come down with coronavirus. So I've heard, yeah. So uh, I have a couple of questions that are follow-ups to what you uh, just, just mentioned. Um, and I'll try and weave these two questions together. So one comes from Rebecca Ayrton, who's the, uh, uh, the president of our student uh, steering committee, our undergraduate steering committee. Uh, and she asks, um, uh, in light of the saying that God protects uh, the simple person, Shomer Petim Hashem, how might one make an argument uh, against that to the Haredi community? Uh, and uh, another question comes from Alexander Miller in uh, San Antonio. Uh, and he also says, uh, uh, is there an argument that you could put forth that you believe the ultra-Orthodox ultra community would consider that would encourage them to be more compliant with social distancing guidelines? Um, thank you for both of those questions. You know, I, I'm a big believer that when one is speaking to people whose commitments aren't exactly, perhaps, whose prior commitments aren't precisely the same as ones are, it's a very good idea to try to speak their language. And I, what I actually would say in both of those circumstances is I would quote the passage uh, in the in the Talmud that I began with today, the passage where uh, the rabbis say um, that once the destroyer with a capital D has been given permission to destroy, he doesn't distinguish between the righteous and the unrighteous. And I, I think I would say to the Haredi community, um, according to this passage in the Talmud, God doesn't protect anybody once the epidemic is in play. God is no longer distinguishing. And, you know, the, the Talmud is very rich. Um, and as you, as you all know, um, the Talmud says about itself that it contains everything uh, within it. Um, the Talmud says about itself, turn it over and turn it over <clears throat> for all is in it. Um, and then it also says in a, in a juxtaposed passage, um, it quotes uh, the Book of Lamentations and it says, uh, he hath cast me in dark places like the dead of the earth. This is the Babylonian Talmud, which is one of my favorite self-reflective passages in any work of literature. So the Talmud itself is telling you that the Talmud itself is full of deeps and darks. So you can find almost anything in the Talmud, and I, I'm not same, claiming that this would be the knockdown point in the argument, but it is at least a point that I think could be made uh, in this context, the idea that there will be special divine providence for the righteous under epidemic conditions is explicitly repudiated by this source in the Talmud. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, I've got another question here from current student, uh, Davy Schoenberg, who asks, what is the constitutionality of the government mandating people stay home? Would it be unlawful incarceration without a trial? So um, to, to move from the sublime to the um, possibly less sublime, but uh, I'll, I'll wear my, I'll put on the hat of my day job and answer the constitutional law question. Um, uh, it, state authorities have what's generally called in American constitutional law, the police power, um, which doesn't necessarily literally mean the power of the police force. Uh, it's an older term in 18th century and, and, and 17th century term referring to the power to issue 
general rules or laws that um, protect health, safety, and welfare. And so that includes the authority for states in the United States to issue quarantine orders. And those quarantine orders are certainly a restriction on liberty, and they would have to be justified if challenged in court. But the standard for justifying them would be at the most rigid, the requirement that there be a compelling government interest, which there certainly is here, protecting people, and the requirement that that, in, that, that interest, uh, that the way that the interest was being effectuated be narrowly tailored to effectuating it. And narrowly narrow tailoring here would be, you couldn't lock down whole swaths of the population if it weren't necessary to reduce the spread of the disease. But if it is in fact necessary to reduce the spread of the disease, and if there is no less restrict, restrictive option for doing so, then a court would uphold that restriction. And at present, lockdown orders would in my, my view, almost certainly survive that. Question's a little harder for the federal government. Congress could certainly order a lockdown order using its power under the interstate commerce provision. The president can't do that unless Congress authorizes him to do that. And Congress has not authorized the president to issue a general lockdown order. And this is something that I think uh, Democrats who've been criticizing President Trump for not issuing a general lockdown order should, should know. The president at present does not have the legal authority to issue a general lockdown order. Congress could change the law to give him that authority. Um, but right now, if the president issued that lockdown order, perhaps some of those Democrats would be happy. I myself would be the first person to say that the president doesn't have the constitutional authority to do so. Uh, great, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna go to uh, one of uh, your former students who I know who's written a question, Nancy Ko. Uh, Nancy, can I unmute you? I see you're cooking something there, but uh, I'm gonna unmute Nancy. It's wonderful to see you, Nancy. I'm good. I, what, what country are you in? What continent are you on? I am on the same continent as I think you're on. I'm in upstate New York right now, which sometimes okay, but, feels like a different continent, actually. <laughs> well, welcome home. Welcome home. From the urban East Coast, but yeah. Should I, do you want me to read it, Donnie? Oh uh, yeah, read it, restate it, whatever you want. Go ahead. Sure. Oh, I was, it was, it was less of a, of a, of a question and more of a comment, which was a metaphysical one, so excuse me. Um, but the sort of thing that you said about the disturbing implication that Passover never ends, it just immediately reminded me of Camus in La Peste or The Plague when he says at the very conclusion, via his uh, protagonist, uh, Dr. Liu, um, uh, but he knew, the doctor knew, however, that this story could not be that of final victory um, for the, you know, the bacteria, the, the plague, never truly dies. And um, there's been a lot written about that kind of, I, I guess we can call it lacrimose account of, of the plague, but I just thought it was uh, worthwhile to, to bring it up in kind of uh, the sort of intersection of plague and total. It's true. I mean, it's a great, it's a very, very opposite passage, Nancy, and thank you for, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, I mean, we don't want this to be the plague that, that never ends, and yet um, the risk, the danger, is always there and the possibility of its recurrence is always there. And if there is a takeaway that resonates for me there, it's that we are accustomed to thinking that, you know, some viruses or bacteria can be eliminated once and for all. You know, we, we have the model of smallpox in front of us and we think smallpox was eradicated. And humans are capable of some amazing things. And that's an instance of, you know, humans through a very concerted, careful and slow effort actually achieving something that substantially enhanced the lives of, of other people. But that doesn't mean we're ever going to be able entirely to avoid um, bad things like this happening. We, we can't. So Nancy, thank you. Characteristically, a stew thing to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, we're going to go to another alumna, this time uh, Lior Levin, who I believe is uh, in New York. Lior, I've unmuted you. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess going back to the sublime, I was wondering what you thought kind of the Talmudic rabbi opinion or, or kind of thought process would be around supporting our kind of loosening and um, softening of our typical Pesach stringencies in terms of eating and cleaning and kind of what their their opinions would be. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Lior. You know, when I when I first um, came up with the topic for this talk, I actually originally thought I was going to talk about the, for lack of a better word, the OCD aspects of traditional Passover observance and the comparably 
um, OCD-ish behavior that we're now mandated to uh, undertake to avoid uh, transmission of the virus. You know, I, I, you know, it's a fascinating feature of the um, of the rabbinic imaginary on Passover that although rabbinic law is always relatively rigid, on Passover it becomes very substantially more rigid. Uh, the central metaphor for this is that um, when the rabbis dictate, when the rabbis take a biblical principle that says you have to separate two substances like milk and meat, they have a reasonable mechanism for dealing with the circumstance where you mess it up. And they say, well, if the ratio of milk to meat or meat to milk is less than 60 to one, then we say whatever, you know, good enough. It's as though the other substance doesn't exist. But when it comes to Passover, the same principle is out the window and the rabbis typically say even one piece of leaven in a, th in a ratio of one to a thousand to uh, Passover appropriate unleavened products is not nullified. So in other words, the, the Passover principle is a principle of madness. It's a principle of you know, uh, OCD extremism um, in which no amount of leaven, uh, however small, can be, uh, can be ignored. And you know, when one is a deeply committed uh, believer and practicer of the tradition, one can accept this even though it's not easy, I think, for anybody, <laughs> you know, and anyone who's, who's grown up in or who's lived in a traditional, uh, traditionally observant Passover home knows that there are some moments in the run-up to Passover when the calm and love that one wishes to convey in a house before a holiday runs a little short as people hurry uh, and try to sustain this unsustainable standard of perfection. Um, what's interesting to me about the present uh, situation is that we we can see a real world scenario where we are actually precisely worried about tiny invisible particles and in which we're engaged in a national discussion about how far we should go and what we should sacrifice to facilitate this. So all that is a long uh, wind up, uh, Lior, to, to saying that I think that um, for those who are committed to traditional observance, when it comes to the rules of leaven, there's no reason to relax those stringencies under these circumstances. In fact, if anything, these circumstances demonstrate and prove that there are times when everybody is just as crazy as a traditional Jew is in observing the Passover. In a way, it makes the whole thing seem less crazy, um, but only in a way. Um, that said, when it comes to lots of other requirements, it's sort of interesting that, and here I, I owe a lot to, uh, to Tamara um, Morsel Eisenberg, whom I mentioned, but also to uh, Menachem Butler, who works with me at the program on Jewish and Israeli law, who sent me today a brand new book just published um, uh, in Israel, collating rabbinical statements in classical responsa about conditions of, um, about conditions of um, uh, epidemic. And it's organized, this book is organized by seasons of the year. And I, of course, I, um, I scrolled immediately to the passages on Passover. And sure enough, there are rabbis under conditions of um, epidemic. I found a rabbi uh, under conditions of epidemic in Aleppo, uh, when there was still a big Jewish community in Aleppo, saying we can't get access in this particular year of plague. We can't get access to matzah that has been watched from so, so, what, matzah made of flour, wherein the wheat was watched from the time of it being harvested. And as you know, traditionally, um, for the matzah that one would use to fulfill the commandment of eating matzah on Passover, one would want to use um, matzah made of flour that had been watched um, from the time that the wheat was cut in order to assure that it was truly kosher for Passover. Not even a hint of water had come anywhere near the, uh, the flour or even the wheat to pre-leaven it. Another good example of the OCD you know, model in play. And the rabbi says, well, you know what? It's only a stringency to use this matzah. And what's more, I've never sworn an oath that I would follow this stringency. And so you know, I'm going to use the matzah that I can get. And so you know, that's a good example of a broader genre where it turns out rabbis have been struggling with this question, Jews have been struggling with this question as long as there have been epidemics, which is as long as there have been people. And um, 
yes, the inevitable necessity of, of leniency in these circumstances has arisen, and where it has arisen, it has been followed. I think the measure is just a measure of necessity. If the necessity is present, the broad trend is for the rabbinic tradition to recognize that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got time for one more question. So I'm going to go to one of our student leaders, Jacob Fortinsky. Jacob, I'm going to unmute you and just let us know where you're uh, calling from. I'm calling from Westchester, New York. Um, thank you, Professor Feldman, for, for speaking. Um, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, obviously countries have a duty towards their own people. I was wondering how you conceive of international duties in this time. Um, two examples come to mind. One is whether China has duties towards the countries in which the virus spread potentially because of their um, inaction or of their suppression of information initially. And the second is um, what sort of duties the West has to developing nations who maybe have less resources and uh, in particular um, Israel towards the occupied territories which have um, shockingly little ventilators and other resources. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, that very rich question. I think I would begin by saying that to me, the, and here I am going to be a little bit inspired by the Talmudic passages that I, that I read you, I think our, our duties should arise here without moralizing about causation in the first instance. And what I mean here is that um, no doubt China will have, Chinese authorities will have a lot to answer for in their initial response to the virus. And that's a serious topic that needs to be explored and, and analyzed. But I don't think that it confers extra duties on China vis-a-vis -vis places where the virus spread. Rather, I think there's a general obligation of all people right now, um, maybe always, but certainly now, to look out for one another to the extent that they're able to do so. And you know, I think, you know, Jacob, you made this point that states have duties. One of the really interesting things about nation states is that they've been acting immediately as though their only priority is their own citizens. And as though it's justifiable ethically or morally to prioritize the health and well-being of their own citizens over other citizens. And I think that's quite wrong. I don't think that it's plausible to say that um, my ethical duties as a citizen of the United States are more strongly under conditions of pandemic to the people who live just over the border in Canada, or to the people who live just over the border in Mexico, or to people who live very, very distant from me, um, are really different than they are to citizens of the United States who live just on our side of the border. I should add that in general, I am actually sympathetic to the view that we have differential types of ethical duties to people based on our shared political responsibilities. I'm not, I'm not an absolute cosmopolitan who believes that borders don't mean anything. I think they do have ethical value and significance in a bunch of circumstances. But when you're talking about the consequences of a pandemic, and that pandemic is by definition one that skips borders, I find it very unconvincing to think that we should weigh the lives of someone who lives just on the other side of those borders lower uh, with a lighter weight than we should weigh the lives of, of, our, of our countrymen. That said, that merely enhances the duties that we have to people who are either in our charge or who are um, under our political control or, or whose lives we're capable of influencing. So if that means that better off countries um, would fail to take responsibility for uh, less developed countries or for poorer countries, I think that would be wrong. I think the ethical responsibility does include uh, aid to poorer countries under these circumstances. And by the way, there's also a self-interested, a strong self-interested reason for doing so. Um, namely that it's not as though if the diseases are allowed to spread in poor countries, they won't make their way back to richer countries. I mean, I'm not making a, you know, a David Hume style argument that this all derives from our self-interest. I'm just adding the self-interest alongside the point of ethical duty. And that's of course, doubly true of, of Israel with respect to, uh, to Palestinians uh, living in the occupied territories. Um, in the first instance, Israel, you know, legally recognizes in its own institutional framework, its own Supreme Court, holds that um, the relationship legally, juridically, between Israel and the territories is governed by the law of occupation. That's the law as interpreted by Israel's courts. There is some subtlety about whether the courts say that the territories are occupied or rather say um, that the laws are, that the, the territories are governed under the laws of occupation. 
And if you're not a lawyer, you're going to find that distinction somewhat meaningless. But if you are a lawyer, I'm just I'm aware of it. I don't want to argue about it, um, but it's there. Um, but you know, the base, basic principle, Jacob, of the law of occupation is a principle of trusteeship, which means a principle of obligation. So the occupier is legally obligated to provide for the welfare of those who are occupied. So under Israel's own binding legal regime, as articulated by its Supreme Court, you could hate that or love it, but regardless, I'm just describing it as you know juridical obligation. Israel has a trusteeship duty to uh, people living, uh, to Palestinians living in the in the occupied territories, and that includes an obligation to their health and well-being, including providing adequate uh, equipment and health care uh, for circumstances of, a, of an epidemic. And that's an ethical duty that Israel should be taking very seriously. And above all, it's also maybe not above all, but equally, it's a duty that Israel should be taking very seriously.